Hey everybody, Peter Valley from Zen Arbitrage here, and welcome to this video where I'm gonna tackle a huge subject, and I'm gonna talk about five myths about textbooks that I almost promise you are costing you a bunch of money. Now, um, it's weird, because one of the biggest myths, actually, we'll get to at the end, so it's kind of a spoiler alert, but one of the myths is that online book arbitrage is just for textbooks, and it, it's not at all. Online book arbitrage works for literally every kind of book, not just textbooks, but people tend to love textbooks because it tends to be where a lot of the money is. So uh, I made this video specifically for people doing online book arbitrage so they can get a better understanding about textbooks as it relates to online book arbitrage. But I think if you're selling on Amazon at all, this video will be very relevant to you, or the vast majority of it. So these are the five things that most people get wrong about textbooks and how you can stop making these mistakes and start making a lot more money. So. Here's the bottom line. If you believe any of these things I'm about to share with you, any of these five things, it's costing you a bunch of money, bottom line. So myth number one is that older editions of textbooks don't sell. This sentiment isn't objectively wrong, but asking that question, do older editions sell, is actually totally the wrong question. And you probably, if you've been selling on Amazon for a while, you see the folly in that question. But the condition, or the 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 the, uh, the demand has nothing to do with the edition. Okay, like literally nothing. So you can put it kind of a different way: is you can determine nothing about a book's demand by knowing how many newer editions there are. So let's just say, that, you know, it's biology, introduction to biology, and they're on edition number, you know, fifteenth edition right now, and you're looking at the eleventh edition. Okay. There's nothing about that information that you have in front of you that should in any way indicate what the demand of the 11th edition is, okay? Older editions still sell. It's not simply, it's not that older editions do sell or they don't sell, it's that it's asking the wrong question and the, 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 the edition is a totally irrelevant data point when it comes to assessing a book's demand, okay? And those of you who have been selling Amazon for a while know where I'm about to go with this. There is only one thing that matters when it comes to addressing a book's demand. Only one thing. It's not the edition, it's not the year the book was printed. Literally everything is irrelevant except for one thing. You know what that is? It's sales rank. Or actually even better, it's average, it's sales rank history, which we display in Zen Arbitrage. Sales rank history is truly the only measure of a book's demand, okay? So, it is entirely irrelevant when it, the, this edition of a book is entirely irrelevant to its demand, okay? So, if you've got the latest edition of a textbook and its sales rank history, as revealed in Keeper or Camel or even better as an arbitrage, is showing that it sells, you know, one copy every three months, then it sells one copy every three months. That's it. The edition doesn't change that fact. The fact is what it is. It's just simply... You know, the edition doesn't care about the facts. It's just simply the demand is what it is. So its edition is totally irrelevant. And conversely, if you've got the 10th, a, a 10 year old copy of a textbook, and it's the seventh edition, and we're on the 13th edition right now, and Keepa or Zen Arbitrage is showing the seventh edition sells every three days, that's all you have to know. It's selling every three days. It doesn't matter if it's 10 years old. It doesn't matter if it's six editions ago. If it's selling, it's selling, right? Facts don't care about the edition, okay? It's just the facts are what they are. The sales rank is what it is. It is immutable, it does not lie, and it simply is the only measure of a book's demand, okay? So you might be wondering, well, how is it possible a textbook that's six editions old and, and 10 years old is still selling? Well, I'm not saying that happens very often. I'm just saying the edition is irrelevant, right? But the fact is we cannot possibly know all the trends, all the economic factors, and all the sort of random odd forces that contribute to a book's demand. Okay, so maybe Amazon's algorithm has a little glitch that for some reason favors an older edition in the search results, right? We just don't know. We don't know. Maybe Oprah was caught <laughs> carrying, maybe TMZ caught her carrying a copy of Macroeconomics, the second edition from 2001, and she was spotted at LAX and the photograph went viral, and maybe that's why the old edition is selling, right? We don't know. We don't know. So any of the point is our assumptions or what, what I more accurately describe as our superstitions about addition are totally irrelevant. All that matters is the data, okay? I cannot stress this enough. So you just have to shut off your brain. The addition is irrelevant, okay? Myth number two is that students care about condition. Well, they actually do care a little bit, but they don't care as much as normal book buyers. So students care a lot of, less about textbook condition than consumers of other books care about the condition for their purchases. So students are a lot more lax. Um, they're, you know, they're just simply more, they don't care. It's just like they're not sweating the details, right? Most, be, let's be honest. 
Details like whether a book has a ding in the corner, that's mostly the domain of old people. Let's be honest, okay? How much do you think a 19-year-old cares about a ding in the corner of a textbook? They've got a social life. They're probably doing drugs at this moment, let's be honest. Who knows? But they're in college. They're busy, right? They're probably stoned or drunk right now. Sorry if you're a parent, but that's just the facts. <laughs> and, um, and they're only buying your textbook because the professor is making them. Do you think they're pulling a... Te- Can you picture a 19-year-old pulling a textbook out of the envelope and going... Hold on a second here. This has a ding in the corner. I'm going to leave bad feedback. That's just not, they just don't care. They don't care, right? So they're not sweating the details. Um, and if you've been selling textbooks at all for any length of time, you, you've seen this. Like you can get away with sort of just um, being a little more looser with your grading standards when it comes to textbooks. So here's the fact here's how textbook buyers, how, how, how students are. They're simply buying the book, they're using it for a few months, and they're never going to look at it again if they look at it at all. Okay, the textbook itself is a complete afterthought in their life. So if you're only shipping in textbooks that are very good condition or better and you're or you're avoiding acceptable condition books, you're avoiding good condition books, you're leaving a ton of money on the table. I really can't stress this enough. Okay, it just simply doesn't matter that much. And excuse the formatting error. (laughs) right here, okay? Myth number three is that textbooks that have cheaper editions available, whether it's Kindle editions or cheaper older editions or cheaper rental copies, simply won't sell or won't sell that well. And that is a totally, just completely wrong, okay? So this serves, this really actually deserves its own video and own po- its own post on FBA Mastery. This being people's habit of using unimportant and extraneous data to make pricing decisions, kind of like we talked about with the addition. It's like extraneous data that just simply doesn't matter, but people tend to cling to it like for some reason. I don't know. It's weird. Um, so when you talk about cheaper editions, we're really talking about three separate markets. Okay, okay. so Kindle is its own market. Okay, so people buying hard copy editions of textbooks aren't buying Kindle. It's a different market, right? Rentals, totally separate market, different demographic, different market. And then hard copy buyers, right? Those are three different markets, three different types of, of, and hard copy buyers mean people are actually purchasing the book to own, right? And then it actually gets even more, you know, different markets altogether. We talk about like, if there's a cheaper copy on eBay, right? People think they have to underprice eBay. That's a different market. It doesn't matter. Totally irrelevant, right? So these groups are not without their overlap, but there's not as much overlap as you think. So if you're shopping for a Kindle version, chances are you're only shopping for a Kindle version of the textbook. If you're a student who wants a rental, chances are you're only looking at rentals. And if you're a student that wants a used book to own, you're probably, or used book rather, you're probably not looking at new copies. You're just looking at used, right? So these are all separate markets, separate demographics within the textbook buyer market. So if you're pricing your textbooks as though your customer was only looking at that column on the page, that's the correct way to price a textbook. So what I mean by that is, you know, only comparing used to used, only comparing Kindle to Kindle, which you can't sell Kindle, so you're not comparing anything, but only comparing older editions to that particular edition, not getting mixed up with other editions, only comparing new copies to new copies, or used to used, or, you know, eBay to eBay, or just not getting caught up in comparing books to any other anything else that's not on that page, right? So if the customer is looking at a page that your book is on, chances are they're not looking at other pages, whether it's the new column, or new tab, or Kindle, all the other stuff, right? So that's really, really important. So with use condition, um, don't get caught up, and this is kind of a caveat, I don't wanna be misunderstood here. Don't get caught up in only pricing very good condition against good condition, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you're pricing used against used, but not good against good, acceptable against acceptable. Um, you can do that. I just tend to think you're still leaving money on the table. These condition differences can affect a man, but not significantly. Yes, having an acceptable condition book does slow sales, but good versus very good just doesn't matter that much. It doesn't really affect sales much at all, as far as I can tell. So when you get caught up on these sort of micro comparisons, it really only serves to drive prices down for everybody, including yourself. So not only do you lose money, but everyone else in the Amazon selling community loses money and it's just, it's just lose, lose. So just, just don't do it. That's my advice. Myth number four is that textbooks only sell during August and January. Oh man, this is the biggest one of all. This is the one that drives me crazy because it's so not true. And it's like, all you have to do is have sold textbooks for any amount of time to know this is not true. But it's still the big myth amongst people that have never actually dipped their toe in the water. They think, oh, textbooks only sell before the semester. And that's just, that's just like so not true. Okay. So the fact is the sales gap between, you know, January and August and the rest of the year is actually flattened out significantly. Okay. So 
here's how here's how it used to work. The world you, we used to inhabit a world where all higher education operated on a uniform schedule. Every school started like at the end of August or early September, and then every semester started again at the beginning of January. That was how every school was, right? That's not the world that exists anymore, okay? So if you believe that textbooks only sell during um, January or August, chances are, in my experience, that's usually an older crowd. Like you're probably in your 40s, 50s, 60s, like, like people understand now that's not how the world works anymore. That's just, that world doesn't exist. There is such huge diversity amongst higher education now between online classes, between schools that don't, don't, uh, just don't even like, don't even practice a standard schedule to, um, just, there's just like so much diversity now that you really cannot plan on it. There just, it just is no uniformity anymore. Okay. So, um, one of the reasons I think the demand is kind of flattened out, the, the textbook season, the, the highs aren't as high anymore, and the low and the lows of the off season aren't as low, is that um, online classes are, are now a huge thing. And actually, the growth of online classes actually slowed. It's not regressed, but it's actually slowed down. But um, there's actually an increase in evergreen type education. So basically, courses that start when you want them to, and it's these are essentially courses that begin as soon as you sign up, no matter what time of year. This is an increasingly common thing. And so from looking at my stacks over, uh, stats over the last few years, the highs of January and August aren't quite as high as they used to be and the lows aren't as low, okay? So it does not mean that sales don't spike. They do, they absolutely spike in August and January, but um, it does not mean that textbooks don't sell the rest of the year. It just means they spike a couple times a year. It doesn't mean they don't sell the rest of the year. So it's more of a glass half full thing than glass half empty, right? And so don't take my word for it. Um, if you still believe that textbooks only sell twice a year, I can promise you you're wrong, but if you don't believe me, pick any textbook published in the last, say, five or so years, just to increase the odds that the book is still in high demand, and then put the ISBN into camelcamelcamel.com or Keepa. okay? Just take the ISBN and just plug it in, or plug it into Zen Arbitrage, for that matter. That's actually the best way to do it. And then just check the average sales rank, and all you have to do, in Zen Arbitrage, we show average sales rank, 12-month average rank, um, and if you look at a graph, it's actually more pronounced, but anytime you see that graph jump up, jump actually down, that means a sale, and so you can clearly see the textbooks are selling all year round. That's all you have to do is look at the chart. Just look at the Keepa chart. It's very, very clear. Or just look at the average sales rankings in arbitrage. And if a book has an average rank of 250,000, there's no way that book's only selling twice a year, right? That's like clearly a book that's selling steadily. So um, you really only have to look at the graphs or the average sales rank to confirm the textbooks do sell year round. So, um, so yes, if you're selling textbooks, you already know this, you're selling lots and lots of textbooks in um, outside of January and August. So um, a slightly less inaccurate belief goes that textbooks only sell steadily during August and January. And this is kind of, I kind of already, already touched on this, but again, the sales rank history does not lie, okay? It just simply doesn't lie. It just, that's just not how it is. It's just textbooks sell year round. So um, don't be confused with, so yeah, textbook sales go up, but it doesn't mean they don't sell the rest of the year, as I just said. So. Um, if you're only sourcing textbooks one time a year, you're only shipping them in one time a year, or you're only thinking about textbooks a couple times a year, you are, man, are you throwing away a ton of money because the rest of us are cashing in all year round while you're caught up in the superstition that textbooks will only sell twice a year, and it's just simply not true. Okay, so the last myth of all is that online book arbitrage is just for textbooks. Now, this is actually more of a myth about online book arbitrage than it is a myth about textbooks, but it's simply wrong. Um, the forces that make online book arbitrage work apply to any book, that, period, that has a steady demand, that also has a big gap between the cheapest price and the cheapest FBA price. That's literally it. Nothing else matters. The type of book is irrelevant, right? So this, this again, comes back to the point I'm, I keep making, which is people love to get hung up on extraneous data points, like the category of a book or the edition of a book or all this stuff. It just like literally just defer to the numbers. And if a book is you know, has a big gap, then it's a suitable book for online book arbitrage, and that's it. Um, and so the people who keep selling you this myth, I think these are the people um, who, the people telling you that online book arbitrage is just for textbooks. These are people selling you tools that have really tiny databases, and so they really don't want, they wanna keep your eyes off of what you're missing. So they just go, okay, yeah, it's only for textbooks, you guys, you're only gonna make money on textbooks. Online book arbitrage is just for textbooks. And so they try to keep your eyes off the fact that their, their, their database is like missing 95% of all books, 
and they, and so that you don't get you you don't actually they don't want you to actually realize this fact. So they tell you, oh yeah, it's just textbooks, just textbooks. And then they fill their database with some textbooks, uh, and you know, and it's like one tenth of what an arbitrage is. And then they tell you, oh yeah, that's just that's just because those are the only books that matter. It's just a lie. It's a complete lie. So. If you are interested in, if I demystified textbooks for you and you are now convinced that this is a sustainable year-round business, um, which it is, you're welcome to jump on board and totally for free. Um, Zenarbitrage.com is the place to do that. You offer a free trial and actually I'm happy to extend the trial. I'm really flexible about that. Just hit reply to the email you get when you sign up. If you need more time, I'm happy to do that for you. I built Zenarbitrage to be a complete business in a box without the box. So it's all inclusive. You get all the tools, you get all the training, you get all of the support, and you get all of the community. It's all built in to one $79 a month package. You literally don't need anything else outside of what we provide you. And you can get all this at zenarbitrage.com. You get access to my cell phone. Like literally, you can text me day or night. Um, we have our main database, which has almost 25 million books, 10 times bigger than any other database, and our separate textbook database. We set up with a we set you up with a prep service partner, so you can literally run this business from anywhere in the world. Um, we show FBA offers inside of our searches, which nobody else does. It's just a complete integrated system, and you can just literally get start making money right away. So zenarbitrage.com is the place for that. And I won't even go into all of the stuff that we offer. Like I said, it's just like literally every tool, every analytics tool, every uh, sourcing technology, everything is built in. We built it up into this insane beast of a system over the last year. And if you're using any other tool, by the way, reach out to me for a secret offer that I, I promise you will not be able to turn down. But if you can't stand the thought of partially automating the process, I actually wrote a book that walks you through how to do online book arbitrage manually with no tools required and no experience. And I offer this book totally for free. Um, actually, I just offer, ask that you pay printing and shipping costs. So it's about $6.90. I shipped it out next day. And uh, it's for the people that don't want to sign up for Zen Arbitrage. And I wanted, I wanted you to have something um, so you can still make money off this system. And uh, I'm just really proud of what I've developed. So I wanted to kind of teach it to the world, no matter where you're at in terms of your resources or anything. So onlinebookarbitrage.com is the place to order the book. And again, I ship it out next day. You can have it in your, inbox, in your mailbox in literally a few days. And um, totally free, like I said, just printing the shipping costs. And it's a step-by-step -step system. It's a 90-page book. It's literally a paperback book. This is not like, this is a book book. And it's full, and I don't hold anything back. There's no bait and switch tactic. It's not like, um, you know, you read the book, but you have to buy this thing to make it work. It's literally just, you just get the entire system. Um, it just takes a little bit longer, actually quite a bit longer than using Zen Arbitrage, but it, it does work. So online book arbitrage is the place for that. So thanks for watching this video. And listen, um, I look forward to seeing you over at Zen Arbitrage, or I look forward to shipping your free book out. Either way, thanks a lot. And by the way, you can always feel free to reach out to me with any questions, uh, support at zenarbitrage.com. Thanks.